Lord, thank you for the truth of your word that grounds us in the faith, reminds us who you are, reminds us what Christ has done, reminds us who we are and what your promises to us are. We ask, Lord, that as we sing these truths and as we open your word together this morning, that you direct our eyes to Christ, help us to see him, to see him as he is, to believe his word, to trust him. Lord, whether we've walked with you for years, whether some here may be new to following Jesus, I pray that what takes place in our midst here would serve to move people towards maturity in Christ, towards greater faith in Christ, towards greater Christ-likeness. And Lord, for some in our midst who may not know you, I pray that as they spend time among us, they would experience the very presence of God, that they would be able to see that the Lord is here and that you are the one who is working in us to save us, to sanctify us, and to use us in the world for your purposes. So Lord, we present ourselves to you now in humility and ask you to speak to us and work through us. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. We get to continue our series through the Gospel of Luke this morning, so please open up to Luke chapter 9. And as you are turning there, I want to ask you a question. I won't make you stand up and answer it. But if I were, think about how you would answer. If you had to stand up right now and define the term disciple, what would you say? A learner. There is an answer. There's a, mon- there's a number of things you, that might come to mind. You might think of somebody who follows teaching, somebody who's a learner. A lot of people would have maybe different ways to describe that. Can you describe it? Can you explain it? Have you internalized the meaning of this important term? Our mission here at Redemption Hill is to glorify God by being and making disciples of Jesus. We've embraced that as as really the reason we exist. We exist to glorify God by being and making disciples of Jesus. So if that's what our mission is, if that's what we're convinced God through his word has called us to do, that's what he's called us to do, it's probably fairly important that we know what it means to be a disciple. If we're supposed to be disciples and make disciples, if we're to to live out this identity and help others to become disciples, we have to understand that, right? Right? Well, in Luke chapter 9, we find Jesus teaching and forming his disciples. And we learn that a disciple is, first of all, at its very basic essence, a believer. We find that in verses 18 through 22. Jesus, as we saw a few weeks ago, he asks the disciples, who do the crowd say that I am? There's various answers to that. But then he asks them the, the real question. In verse 20, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. A disciple is one who believes that Jesus is the Christ, that he is God's son, that he is the promised deliverer who saves us by his death and resurrection. And this confession, this acknowledgement of the truth is essential to saving faith. You must believe that Jesus is the Christ. But Jesus doesn't stop at this confession by Peter. He doesn't stop and say, great, class dismissed. You've learned everything you need to know You've got it. No, Jesus actually presses deeper. First of all, he explains what his mission is in verses 21 and 22. And then in verses 23 through 26, which is our text for today, Jesus further defines what it really means to be a disciple. A disciple is not only a believer. A disciple is a follower, a follower. Our text this morning is Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 26. And let's read it together. Follow along as I read. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the son of man be ashamed When he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. What we discover here in Jesus' teaching of the 12 is that Jesus doesn't just want us to know the truth, although that is essential. Christ calls us to respond to the truth. He wants our confession to result in a commitment. Faith in Jesus produces followers. I think that's a way we could really sum up this text, that faith in Jesus produces followers. He calls us to come after him. 
That's what a disciple does. That's what a disciple is. Someone who believes the word of Christ, having learned from him, having been taught by him, and then follows Christ. So in our text today, what what I want to look at is three truths we need to know if we're going to be followers of Jesus. What does it really look like? What is entailed? What is required? What do we need to understand about following Jesus? Three truths. And the first is found in verse 23. Number one, following Jesus is costly. It's costly. He said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Again, the disciples already believed that Jesus was the Christ. But simply knowing who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah, that that wasn't the whole picture. So Jesus had gone on to explain exactly what kind of Messiah he came to be, what kind of Christ he was. Did Jesus come to be a political liberator or a military conqueror? No. No, the Christ would be one who would suffer. Verse 21, following this confession, he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. For Jesus, the Messiah, the path to glory the path to glory would lead him directly to the cross. And this truth would have serious implications for anyone who would follow Jesus, anyone who would be joined to him in faith, anyone who believed that he really was the Messiah would then share in that path. He says in verse 23, following this explanation of what kind of Messiah he was, he says, if anyone would then come after me, here's what's going to be required. What Jesus does here when he says, if anyone would come after me, is he's drawing a line in the sand. Saying, listen, if you want to follow me, if you desire to be with me, if you're convinced that I really am the Messiah, and you want to be on my team, you want to be a citizen of my kingdom, then here is what you must do. And Jesus summarizes the duty of the disciple with these three imperatives, three verbs, three commands. Let him deny himself Take up his cross daily and follow me. First of all, Jesus says, you must deny yourself if you're going to follow me. You might ask, what does this self-denial look like? Is Jesus saying we have to eat stale bread and only drink water and sleep on the ground and somehow make our life difficult and and, and avoid all of the comforts and the pleasures and the blessings that, that God has provided in this world? Are we supposed to reject all of those things, the comforts of life, that most people get to enjoy. No, that's not what Jesus means by self-denial. Jesus is not calling us to unnecessary, self-inflicted suffering. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Colossians says that that approach to life and spirituality, asceticism, this denial of the comforts of life and making your own life difficult, there's no spiritual value in that. Paul says it's a waste. It, it, It profits nothing. It's of no value against the flesh. No, when Jesus calls us to deny the self, he's actually calling us to something greater than that, something that's even harder than that. When Jesus calls us to self-denial, he is saying, listen, following me requires the dethroning of the self. It's a lot easier to skip a meal, to wear uncomfortable clothes, than it is to dethrone the self. Denial of self means refusing to allow yourself, your comfort, your glory, your agenda, your desires to be at the center. It means you refuse to allow yourself to be sovereign and supreme in your life because that position is given to Christ. It means renouncing your own autonomy, your own rights. It means if there's ever any conflict between what you want and between what Christ wants, if there's ever any tension between your will and God's will, what he desires and what you desire, then your commitment is to say no to yourself and to say yes to Christ. That is what self-denial means. And this is difficult because it is absolutely contrary to everything in us. Self-denial is completely contrary to our nature. We naturally love and pursue comfort, don't we? Who here doesn't want their life to be easier? (laughs) We naturally pursue pleasure. We want to feel good. 
We want to experience joy. We want to be at ease. We want to be entertained. We want to be recognized. We want to be appreciated. We want to be approved of. And we even believe sometimes deep in our heart that we need those things. Which means that we tend to violently oppose anything and anyone that interferes with our pursuit of what we believe ourself really needs. You see, human nature is not to deny self. Our nature is to deify self. It's not, this idea of self-denial is not just contrary to what's in us in terms of our flesh. This concept of self-denial is also completely antithetical to everything around us. It's contrary in every way to what our culture celebrates. The way of the world is not self-denial. The way of the world is self-expression, self-care. Maybe you've heard that term. Self-actualization, self-esteem. The highest value for the world is being true to yourself. Our world worships the self. For example, the world says, I don't care what God may have written and given us in his law about sex and marriage, about, uh, about what that is supposed to look like. Being with someone of the same sex is what my inner self desires. So therefore, I will do what pleases me. The world says, I don't care if God made me a male or a female at birth. My inner self identifies as something else. So I'm going to present myself as a different gender. I'm going to modify my body and my appearance as I see fit because I believe that the path to wholeness and the path to happiness is self-expression. I will be true to myself. The world says, I know this little baby inside me is a living human being, but I cannot allow my lifestyle to be impeded by the inconvenience of a child. So I'm going to abort it. It's my body, it's my life, it's my choice, it is my legal right to do so. That's how the world thinks. They have deified the self. And any suggestion of self-denial in those scenarios, if you suggest self-denial to someone who feels the pull of same-sex attraction, someone who wrestles with gender dysphoria, someone who who is carrying an unwanted pregnancy, if you suggest self-denial, you will be met with outrage and extreme opposition because our culture has this idolatrous obsession with the self. But before you get too judgmental on all the people out there, let's look in the mirror for a moment. Take a good look at your own heart. How do you handle it when you don't get your way? In your marriage, at your workplace, in the church. Do you get mad? Do you get hurt? How do you handle it when people don't approve of you? Do you feel wounded? Do you feel wronged? Do you feel like a victim? How do you handle it when you fail at something? When you don't accomplish what you really want to accomplish in life, do you get angry? Do you feel sorry for yourself? Do you envy others and their success? How do you handle it when you are confronted with sin by a brother or sister in Christ? Do you become offended? Do you become defensive? Are you embarrassed? Do you feel defeated and crushed? How do you respond when your plans, your goals, your schedule is interrupted or inconvenienced? Are you frustrated? Are you irritated? We too wrestle with the enthronement of the self and everything the self desires, everything the self wants, everything the self believes it needs. We too want glory. We too want to have control. We too want to be sovereign. Just like Adam and Eve, we want to decide for ourselves between good and evil. And so we feel that pull to deify the self. But Jesus Christ calls you and he calls me to self-denial. To say no to ourselves and our desires and our appetites. To say no to our emotions. To say no even to our perceived needs. And to say yes and always yes to God to say yes to his will, to say yes to his word, to say yes and embrace his sovereign plan for our life. So as Jesus draws this line in the sand, he says, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself. He's implying that if you don't deny yourself, if you won't deny yourself, then you cannot be his disciple. If anyone would follow me, Jesus says, first of all, you must deny yourself. Second, he says, you must take up your cross daily. You must take up your cross. The imagery of the cross in in the first century, it was not a piece of jewelry that people would wear or a stylish tattoo. 
Absolutely the opposite. It was a horrific and brutal metaphor that Jesus is using that was understood all too well by those who were under Roman rule. The Romans had perfected this cruel method of torture and execution, and they used it to humiliate their enemies. They used it to intimidate anyone that would even think about resisting their authority. In fact, 70 years before Jesus was born, there was a slave revolt led by a former slave named Spartacus. And the Roman army crushed that rebellion and they took 6,000 of those slaves and crucified them and lined the highway to Rome with their crosses and corpses. That's a big statement. And the Romans would often force their unwilling victims to carry their own crossbeam, adding insult to injury. They would have to carry their own instrument of death as they marched to their execution. And this was a way to publicly demonstrate their forced submission to the power and the authority of the state. This person has been subjugated, brought underneath the authority of Rome. We won, you lost. Behold the power of the Roman Empire. That's what it meant to carry your crossbeam. But Jesus calls his disciples not to be subjugated by force to the state, He's calling them to a willing submission. You pick up your cross. Take up your cross. Voluntarily submit yourself, not to the authority of Rome, but to the authority of Christ. Taking up your cross is far more than just denial of self. It's the death of self. It means the death of everything you used to be, your autonomy. It means you consider that your life, as it was before, is over. It's done. And this command by Jesus would have been obviously very shocking to the disciples as they're listening to Jesus teach. They hated Roman rule. And they were mostly excited about Jesus because they hoped that he would be a political deliverer. They hoped that he would be a military Messiah who would drive out the Romans and restore the kingdom to Israel. They wanted a revolution. But Jesus was bringing about redemption. He didn't call them to take up their sword and follow him. He called them at this moment to take up their cross and to embrace suffering, to embrace the shame of being associated with this kind of Messiah, to embrace the humility of what God was calling them to. This call to take up your cross presented them and it presents us with a choice. There's difficulty, there is is shame, there's even suffering that is associated with bearing your cross. And now there's a certain kind of suffering none of us can avoid. Whether you follow Jesus or not, whether you believe in the gospel or not, simply living in this world means we're all bound to suffer. Cancer and death and loss and tragedy, some of these things affect us all. There's no way to avoid it. But listen, there is some suffering. There is some kinds of difficulty that's actually unique to the Christian experience. There's some kinds of suffering and difficulty you can actually avoid. There's some bullets you could dodge because that suffering and that difficulty is is a result of identifying with Christ. Jesus says, if you will follow me, then bend down, take up your cross, embrace this path of difficulty and sacrifice and even suffering and follow me. The words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor during World War II, They ring true. He writes, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. As we heard last week from the book of Galatians, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live now, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's who I am, Paul says. That's my identity. I'm carrying my cross. Such a decision to carry your cross is a decision from which there is no looking back. That's a one-way trip. People don't carry their cross and then come back. It's the complete opposite of how many people try to follow Jesus. Many people like to keep their options open. Many people ride the fence. Many people will dip their toes in the water and sort of try out this Christianity thing. But listen, Jesus wants your life. Jesus demands your all. He says, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself and take up your cross. And Jesus says, this is more than just a one-time decision. It's more than a one-time commitment. Look at what he says. He says, you must take up your cross daily. 
This is a daily duty. For the Christian, this is a way of life. This becomes a daily rhythm that we consciously, by faith, submit ourselves to this calling each day. Listen, every time you open God's word, you are presented with an opportunity to take up your cross in obedience to Christ. Because God is going to lay before you his will for your life. And you have a choice. Will you take up your cross or will you say no? Every time you fall into sin, you are presented with an opportunity. Will you take up your cross in repentance or will you say no? Every time you face trials and suffering in your life, you're presented with an opportunity. Will you take up your cross in perseverance and faith or say no? Every time you face rejection, every time you face mockery, every time you face opposition for your faith in Christ, it's an opportunity to take up your cross in allegiance to him, to identify with him, or to take the path of least resistance. Listen, taking up your cross is not some end-of-life act of heroism for the believer. That's actually step one on the Christian journey, and it's a way of living day in and day out. It is a life of submitting to the authority of our master and identifying with him and obeying him no matter the cost. So Jesus says, if you want to follow me, You must deny yourself, and you must take up your cross each and every day. And then thirdly, Jesus says, follow me. Follow me. He's already given two negatives. You must deny yourself, and then there's the death of self and taking up your cross. But then finally, Jesus gives us this positive command that we are to dedicate ourselves to him, to following him. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. I have to wonder how this command fell upon the ears of the 12 because they're already following him, right? They left behind their boats and their nets and their businesses. They left behind family and they are traveling with Jesus. They're in close proximity to him, sitting at his feet. But now Jesus is really laying out their calling at a much deeper level. He's revealed to them his true identity. Who do you say that I am? And and Peter confesses, we believe that you are the Christ. You are the promised Messiah. Jesus has then further revealed to them his true mission. Listen, I came to suffer, to be rejected, to die, and to rise again, verse 22, on the third day. And now comes, in light of those realities, the true essence of their call. In light of all that, will you still follow me? Are you in or are you out? Knowing now what you know about who I am and what I've come to do and what it will cost to follow me, will you follow Will you commit your life to Jesus and follow his example? Will you commit your life to identify with Jesus? Will you share in his suffering and shame? Will they deny themselves and take up their cross? Be willing even to lay down their life for him. Following Jesus is costly. It is costly, yes. But if you will not do this, then you cannot be his disciple. Now, this would be a grim message if Jesus stopped there, wouldn't it? If that's it, if we close up the Bibles and said, that, there you go, be warmed and be filled, we'll see you next Sunday. That feels pretty heavy. Following Jesus is costly, that's true. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on to reveal a second truth we need to understand about being a follower of Jesus. Number two, following Jesus is not just costly, it is also worth it. Following Jesus is worth it. Look in verse 24. He says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Jesus has very plainly spelled out, yes, there is a cost to discipleship. But he also makes clear that the investment is worth it. The return on this investment, when you consider what you put in and what you then get out, Jesus says, there is a great return on this investment. It is worth it. He makes this seemingly paradoxical statement in verse 24, that whoever saves his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And this this statement only makes sense if we understand and recognize that the word life here really has two senses. It has a double meaning. In one sense, your life refers and describes your physical life. It's your experiences in this world. It's your health. It's things you enjoy. It's things you possess. 
Uh, it, it's relationships that you may have. It's the, the, the things that make up your human experience in terms of a physical created creature here on this world. So in one sense, that's your life. But on the other hand, Jesus refers to life here as that inner part of you, the, the soul, the eternal part of who you are, your spirit, that immaterial aspect of, of what it means to be human, that part of you that will not cease to exist at death, that part of you that will continue on forever. So Jesus says that whoever would save his life, the things you possess here, your health, your status, your experiences, your relationships, your money, all of that, whoever would save that life here on this world will actually lose it. But whoever is willing to lose all those things, you lose your life for my sake, you actually save it. True life, the essence of life, the immaterial part of you that is capable of experiencing joy and peace forever, you can actually save that part of what it means to be alive. Jesus is comparing and contrasting here your temporal physical life with your eternal spiritual life. And he says you can hold on to one temporarily, but you'll lose the other for eternity. Or you can give up the first now and gain the other forever. And the irony here is that our human attempts to preserve our lives is ultimately counterproductive. And that true gain, if you really want to save it, save your life, true gain comes through loss. To persuade us, Jesus does a bit of a cost analysis here. He looks at, at where the real profit is in verse 25. He says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Jesus aims to persuade us to understand and agree with his statement that if you save your life here and lose it, that's a bad decision and you've settled for less. He wants us to consider if there's anything in the world even the whole world itself, hypothetically speaking, is there anything you could gain here in this life that would be worth losing your soul for eternity? That's a powerful question. We can go elsewhere in scripture and consider what is the value of the world and the things of the world. Well, 1 John 2.17 says the world is passing away along with its desires. 1 Timothy 6.7 says we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. That's the way it is. Matthew 6, 19, Jesus says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. When you understand the world that way, is that really what you want to sacrifice your soul to gain? The things in the world are passing away. The world itself, Hebrews 12 tells us, is scheduled for an upgrade. The things we see now are destined to be shaken. And those who believe in Christ are going to receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So do you really want to lose your eternal soul in order to gain some small claim on this sinking ship? Jesus says, think about it. Do the math. Count the cost. Is there really any profit in that? Consider for yourself. Would you trade your eternal soul for the temporary applause of men? Would that be worth it? Would you trade your soul, your eternal destiny, for a few momentary pleasures in this world? Does it make sense to, to trade your own soul for a few short years on this world of serving and loving and pleasing yourself? It's a rhetorical question that Jesus asks. What does it profit? There's no contest. The cost of discipleship is high, yes, and it may even feel sometimes like you're losing your life, but Jesus says the reward greatly overshadows the cost. In the 1950s, there was a missionary to Central America named Jim Elliott who ended up being martyred trying to take the gospel to an unreached people group. And he famously wrote, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Friends, that's wisdom. That's wisdom. That's a man who has counted the cost and evaluated these words of Jesus. And he's made his decision. This is an eternal perspective that does consider the cost, but then joyfully agrees with Jesus to deny self and take up the cross and follow him. The Apostle Paul had the same perspective. In Romans 8, verse 18, he writes, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, the sufferings of self-denial, 
the sufferings of taking up your cross, the sufferings that may come to those who follow Jesus. Paul says the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul had done the math. Paul had counted the cost and he knew that it was worth it to embrace this cost analysis, to make this kind of investment, friends, it's, it calls for faith. It takes faith to believe that this is true, to actually believe that following Jesus is worth it. If you don't believe that, you will never be able to live a life of self-denial and taking up your cross and following Jesus. This calls for faith. But listen, the, the faith that Jesus calls for is not blind faith. It is not irrational faith. No, the faith he calls us to is a calculated investment, believing that it really is worth it. Biblical faith actually is meant to have an expectation of reward. Hebrews 11.6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God, or you could even maybe swap out this phrase, whoever would follow Christ must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Faith is believing in that reward. Our faith must have this element of expectation. Moses is an example of this in Hebrews chapter 11. In verse 24, it says that by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Moses believed that suffering with the people of Israel, this slave nation, was better than his place of privilege in, in the mansions of Pharaoh. He believed it. He embraced reproach and difficulty, rejection and hardship because he was looking to the reward. That's the faith that Jesus calls us to. We have to believe that it is worth it. Otherwise, you'll never be able to sustain this life of self-denial and taking up your cross. C.S. Lewis once wrote that our desires are actually not too strong. They're too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. There are many who say no to the call to follow Christ. They look at the cost. They look at the self-denial and the, the humility that comes with taking up your cross. And they go, I just don't think that's worth it. But scripture clearly portrays that decision as being foolish Blind, short-sighted, and tragic. It's tragic. Listen, those who lose all in this world gain all in Christ. We gain life in Christ. We gain salvation in Christ. We gain adoption into God's family through Christ. We gain an eternal inheritance in the kingdom of God with Christ. We gain infinite glory and joy in the presence of Christ. We gain lasting comfort and rest with Christ. It's worth it. It's worth it. Following Jesus, though costly, is infinitely worth it. So following Jesus is costly. Following Jesus is worth it. And then third, Jesus makes sure we understand that following Jesus is necessary. It is incredibly necessary. It is crucial. Look in verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words... Of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I think the disciples might have been suffering at this point from a bit of messianic whiplash. <laughs> you think about it, the, the excitement of this moment that, that Jesus has just gotten them to confess and he's even confirmed that, yes, he is the Christ. But then he's followed it up with this startling statement that he's going to be rejected and suffer and die. And then he tells them that following him requires that they have to deny themselves and take up their cross. I mean, their head is probably spinning at this point. So Jesus reminds them it is worth it to do this. And then he reminds them also that it's necessary. It's necessary that they follow him. 
There would be many in Israel who would find this concept of the Messiah and this call to follow him just too much to accept, too much to swallow. To them, this idea of a Messiah who was put to death by Rome, that was shameful. That was embarrassing. In anticipating this, Jesus gives a warning. He gives a warning in verse 26. Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words... These words that that have explained that my call is to die and rise again, these words that call you to deny yourself and take up your cross, if you're ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. When Jesus says, if anyone is ashamed of me, he doesn't mean that you feel some little twinge of embarrassment with being associated with Christ. Otherwise, that warning doesn't really pack much of a punch, does it? Jesus isn't saying, I will be mildly embarrassed of you if, when I come back. And that wouldn't really land that heavily on them. And when Jesus refers here to being ashamed of him, he's referring to those who stumble over this idea of a crucified Messiah. They just can't accept it. He's really describing here unbelief. Those who reject him as the Messiah because he's not the kind of Messiah they want and this isn't the kind of discipleship that they thought they were signing up for. Those who reject Christ in this way, who say no to him and his call to follow, Jesus says, if you reject me, then I will reject you. There is a cost to following Jesus, but there's also a cost to not following Jesus. He's already taught his disciples that he's not just going to die Look back in verse 22. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. But look at this last phrase. And on the third day, he will be raised. He will be raised. The resurrection is a glorious triumph over death. Jesus says, I'm going to be humiliated and victimized, but but vindication is coming. Glory is coming. We look at the language of glory down here in verse 26. This idea of the Son of Man is a glorious image. It's this vision that Daniel saw in Daniel, the book of Daniel, of the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great glory. And he's given an eternal kingdom so that everyone bows the knee to him. That's a glorious image. The Son of Man just radiates glory. He says he's going to come in glory. He's coming in the glory of the Father, coming with the glory of the holy angels. There is glory all throughout this verse. There's glory coming. And Jesus, as the one who's preaching about a coming kingdom, he's one day going to receive all of that glory. He's going to rule and reign over the kingdom of God. And so he's giving them a warning When I come back in glory and power as the son of man, do you want me to be for you or do you want me to be against you? See, identification with Jesus now is essential for those who want to be identified with him later. Following Jesus is not only worth it, it's necessary. Your eternal destiny depends on how you respond to Christ right now. You see, there's only two kinds of people, those who follow Christ And they reap the reward of eternal joy with him. They reap glory. And then there's a different kind of person, those who reject him. And they experience his judgment for all eternity. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And further on in verse 46, as he identifies who belongs where, Jesus says, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Eternal punishment, eternal life. Sheep and goats. Jesus is going to separate them out when he returns. With that backdrop, consider what Jesus says. Whoever is ashamed of me, whoever stumbles over me, rejects me, he says, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Listen, a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, that's not some special class of Christian. It just means a genuine Christian, an actual Christian. One who will not follow Jesus 
is not a Christian. And that leads to judgment. Following Jesus is costly. Following Jesus is worth it. And following Jesus is necessary. You must choose whether to say yes or no to the authoritative call of Christ. You may be here today. You may believe the truth that Jesus is the Christ. You may believe that he is the son of God. You can echo the confession of Peter in verse 22, that you are the Christ of God. That's great. Amen. That is step one. Now, let me ask you, what are you going to do with that knowledge of the truth? Are you a follower of Jesus? Have you embraced that call to deny yourself, to take up your cross and follow him? This is what it means to embrace Jesus, not only as Savior, trusting in his work, but also as Lord, as your master, bowing your knee to his authority. And this is what is required of disciples. Following Jesus is hard, but it is worth it. It is worth it. If we lose the whole world, if you have to give up that one thing that's in the back of your mind right now, if you have to humble yourself in that one relationship, if you have to give up that one secret hidden sin, if you have to make that one sacrifice that you've really not wanted to make, Jesus promises that it is worth it. If you lose the whole world, but you experience the salvation of your soul. You gain everything in Christ. But if you choose instead to serve yourself, if you choose instead to preserve yourself and to avoid the difficulty of discipleship, Jesus warns you, you will face an eternal loss, eternal judgment. So you have to respond to this call. Will you say yes to Christ and no to yourself? Will you believe that it's worth it? Will you embrace this reality each day as you take up your cross to follow? I pray that you will. May we be a church that is faithful to glorify God by being and making disciples of Jesus. May we follow him. I pray that you will be filled with this expectation of reward, this hope of glory, because you know that when Jesus comes back, he will embrace you as his own. This is the call. And if you're on the fence today, consider the words of Jesus, and then look around you and consider what God has done in the lives of many who are here. There are many here who have put their shoulder against the crossbeam and they've believed with joy that it is worth it to follow Jesus. We invite you to join us on that journey. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your word is clear. It's not hard to understand. It's just hard to obey sometimes. Lord, there are many things that call for our loyalty and our allegiance our careers, various relationships, different pleasures and comforts we hold on to. Lord, I ask that you would help us to see the infinite worth of Christ, that knowing him would cause everything else to look like rubbish in our eyes. Lord, for those who are in the midst of difficulty right now, I pray that they would believe that it's worth it to follow Jesus. I pray that you would strengthen them to humble themselves, to deny themselves, and to keep following you. Lord, if there's anyone on the fence today, I pray that you would free them from that self-deception that thinks they are okay with you if they have not surrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Lord, open their eyes to their need. Help them to see that there's only one way, and it's to come to Christ and to trust in him and to submit to him. I pray that the faith we profess would produce in us a commitment to follow Jesus. Lord, be glorified in this church as we seek to follow you. Strengthen us by your spirit and receive all the glory from the fruit that comes. We pray this, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.